So one question, I had made my first three projects that I charge really low so that I can build my portfolio site, which is almost done. Now, how do I find high paying clients and how do I approach overseas? Very good question. So let me start with the end of the question first, and then I will tell you how you can find better clients. So what I see time and time again, and if you followed the the, the first episode of the WP show, you probably know that, but typically some people are going to answer if you try to call, email them or call, call, uh, call them. But many people, they kind of know the game now. They're not even going to answer. So the best thing you should do is to just start building relationships. If you want to find a client overseas, obviously it's going to be hard for you to just call a company and say, hey, I can help you with your web design. You know, they get maybe 20 emails like this a week or sometimes a day, depending on how popular they are. So one other thing you could do is to ju- just join some groups. There are some private groups online. There are some forums. Try to get with people from the industry and help. And even if you're just getting started, maybe you can help on something specific. Maybe you're good at design. Maybe you're good at CSS. I don't know, but you need to up your skills at one point. But even if it's just one thing that you can do, be there and be encouraging in those groups. So what's going to happen and what often happens in those groups, let's say that you are specialized with Elementor and you're always helpful. So you're not trying to sell anything. You're just building relationship with other peers in the group. What's going to happen at one point is someone in the group is going to say, hey, I got a lot of um, business working my way and actually need help. I need some people that really master Elementor. Now, if they've been talking to you for like three months or six months and you're always helpful, and if you send them a DM saying, hey, I just saw that you're looking to outsource, I would love, absolutely love that position because that's something I'm looking for and I think I can do good work for you. Here's my portfolio. Let me know if you're interested. By doing that, you get way more chances to get the gig than someone that just cold messaged them, if you get what I'm saying. So that's one thing. Now, the next thing you can do, and maybe that's not for overseas, but locally, because sometimes people tell me, well, in my market, it's it's only people don't want to pay a lot. And I know that's true. But in every market, there, there are some companies that sell for a high price. So what you need to do is to know where to find those people because and i know a lot of people disagree with this but if you're just going to be on google the high paying clients most of the time they look into their own network they ask people can you recommend someone because of course they can go to google and find a lot of companies but usually what they want is the security of knowing that the professional they're going to pick has a good track record so usually they ask around So one good thing you can do is to find business networking groups. And I know it sounds old school, but think about it. If everybody is on Upwork and Fiverr, where it's the never ending race to the bottom with prices, if you go into those groups and yeah, you may have to invest a little bit of money, sometimes it really depends. Some of those groups are totally free, but usually you need to go into groups where you pay a little amount. You meet the people, you go with a business card, you dress well. And you just explain what you do. And in a lot of those groups, the thing is, if you join one of these groups as a member, usually there's no competition between the members. So if you manage to get a spot as a web designer, there won't be any other web designer. So every time there are new guests and you're just going to pitch your services in like 30 seconds, you have a very good chance of closing the deal because usually those people are invited by other peers, other people from their industry or just some friends that are also have some businesses so usually what happens is that when they're going to meet you the barriers are really lowered which is the total opposite of when you cold email someone like me like i said i never answered those emails just because i don't know someone that never talked to me the first thing they do they try to sell me something it's just like when you walk in the street someone runs up to you hey do you want to buy this and this and that and you know whereas maybe if i know that person and hang around with that person maybe I'll be the one willing to purchase, willing to help them out. See, it's not about not willing to work with people overseas. It's just about, hey, I don't know those people. Why would I work with them? Maybe it's a scam. I much rather ask someone in my circle, hey, do you know? Let's say I'm looking for a plumber. I'm going to ask, hey, do you know a good plumber? Because, you know, I'm tired of getting ripped off. Now, luckily for me, I know a good one uh, in one of the business groups where I go. But you get the idea. 
And Zaki says, I totally agree with the relationship. That's what I mean. Relationship first, and it might take some time, but that's going to pay so much in the end. And the thing is, those relationships, it's not just about the money. It's some people, you become friends with them in the way of business. I'm not saying you're going to go and you know spend your holidays with those people, but you kind of become friends with those people. And um, they're going to recommend you. You're going to recommend them. It's a healthy, professional relationship. And then referrals. You know, sometimes I still get to this day some clients that I sent from clients from four or five years ago, which is which is great. Okay, so Niran says, that's great. How about making a Loom video and make a short audit of their site? I see people are running Google ads, but their site is not good, so they may invest in a redesign. That's a good idea, but you always need to be careful because maybe you're going to do an audit and say, okay, this, 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 this doesn't work. And then maybe it's the son of the owner of the business that made the website. Maybe it's his wife. So he may get offended if he doesn't know you. Maybe you you can try. Maybe one thing you could do is just, and that's something I do also, when I look at a website, I always try to find what's the positive point about the website. And I've already talked about the mini audits. Usually I do those live or, I mean, face-to-face or in a live stream because then I can see the reaction of the people I'm talking to. So once again, it's not cold calling, but let's say someone is interested and I'm going to make a video call I say, would you, would you like me to do a quick mini audit? Most of the time they say, yeah. And then I look at the positive. The positive could just be, okay, hey, you got a SSN certificate on your website. It's pretty good. You know, kudos to you. And then I start going down from the top. I think I should do this on the live stream here on the channel, or maybe I release a video of how to do the mini audits, if you guys are interested. Because you really need to always look at the reaction of the people, I mean, the person you're talking to. Because some people are interested about design, some people are interested about security, you need to know what their focus is. Because even a mini audit, there are many things you can talk about. So it's much better to focus on what's important to them. And yeah, like I said, I know for the redesign, you know, (laughs) I love web design, I love design. So when I see an ugly website, the first thing I want to say is, whoa, this is ugly. But (laughs) I've learned with experience, never, ever, ever do this. Never, because you never know who build the website. Maybe it's the owner themselves. So usually what I would say is, and I'm being honest because sometimes they are using some techniques that used to look good 20 years ago. For example, some old shadows that people see used today. Usually what I would say is, well, those shadows used to be very popular at one point, but you know, web design is like fashion. Things come and go. Maybe the shadows are going to be popular next year, but right now it doesn't really work out especially for your brand and what you're trying to convey. And that's how I show expertise, you know, but I'll, I will not go and say, oh, this is ugly. Even if I, sometimes I think it's ugly, but hey, there, there's a reason why I'm the professional and they're looking for my help because if they were good at designing this, then, you know, I would be out of a job. So yeah, maybe you can try with a few customers, maybe start the audit and say, well, I'm really interested in working with you. I like your brand. Try to pick a brand that you genuinely like and see something, how you could improve something and follow those advice. Don't attack up front. You never know who built the website. And Zaki says, I lost a business once because I gave my feedback on an ugly logo. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. This is exactly what, I, what I've been through. I mean, I lost the business. They didn't tell me, but I knew I completely messed up. You know, it was when I, w- I was getting started and the website had been made by the, um, yeah, I think it was the owner's wife. And I think the logo was made by his sister or something. And I completely demolished <laughs> the whole thing because I thought this had been made by someone that was supposed to be a professional and I was just getting started in the industry and I thought this was the way to go. I never got the business. So (laughs) I had to learn the hard way. So Zaki says, so what would you do? How do you deal with it? I mean, the logo was something with hundreds of colors and IDs and text. Should I say, whoa, it's nice? No, not at all. But one thing you can do is, for for example, let's say that uh, the brand is a brand selling, selling sodas. And let's say the the logo is really ugly and they're contacting you because they are struggling with with sales, with their branding. I would look at objective ways. So first of all, I always talk about what is a good logo. And this is really based on objective things. Like it should be recognizable at a small size or at a big size. 
it should look good in black and white. Those, those kind of elements I've already covered. I think I have one video specifically about that. So I always start with this. So I'm preparing them mentally. And then what really helps me sometimes is when their logo is way too vertical. So when you're on the mobile, it takes like a third of the screen. So I always tell them, well, see, most of the people are going to see the website on the mobile. And on the mobile, the only way they can recognize the logo is to make it huge. And you're going to waste a lot of screen real estate. I really think a redesign of the logo or even just a slight evolution could really help. Usually you see how they react. Some some of the clients will say, no, there's no way you don't change the logo. For example, lately I had a client, one of her clients had a logo and it's a winery. So yeah, that's going to be harder, you know, when for, for, for a winery. But if it's a client that just said, that, you know, they have their logo, they designed themselves and they don't really care, you know, they couldn't care less, they didn't spend much time on it, then it's an opportunity. And usually what, what, what I do these days, either I'm going to sell a logo redesign, but usually I don't just do the logo, usually I do a full identity. Or one thing I do now is when the logo is way, how could I put that? When the logo is really not usable, I'm going to offer a typographic logo. So let's say they signed up for the redesign of the website. I'm just going to include the typographic logo. And when I say typographic logo, I'm not going to spend any time on it. I'm just going to choose a nice font like you saw here. So what you see here in the top left corner, this is a typographic logo. So most of the time when I do these for free, I just use the same font and I tell the client up front, there won't be any revision on the logo. It's take it or leave it. Basically, it's like this. And most of the time, nine times out of 10, they're happy with it and they take it. And then I'm happy because this is something that I will be able to show in my portfolio. And if they don't, well, it's their money, it's their website. And I, I just stop fighting with it. You know, once I've explained everything, if they still want to pursue with their ID, like I said, it's their money. I'm not, I'm not going to fight. So, but usually I'm trying to choose my clients up front. So usually when I see that it's going to be a bit complicated because they don't trust my expertise, then usually I'm trying to avoid those clients. Now, I know that sometimes it's not really possible because you need the money or it's a good opportunity and you have a business you have to run. But like I said, what really helped me is to just let go because at the beginning I was always trying to create the best things and I still do, but... I'm not going to go mad or <laughs> get sick about an ugly looking website because they don't want to trust me. All it's teaching me is that the next time I should see the red flags and then maybe not work with those people. But hey, sometimes it happens. And yeah, that's the best advice I could give. From the top of my head is that the logo should be recognizable at a small size or in a big size, in black and white or in color. You know, and there are a few other things that basically... It's about that. And like I said, when you start explaining this, most people, they will understand that, okay, if they want a good brand, they want a nice looking website, you need to have something to work with. 